Shabbat Shalom. The God of the Bible is not my God. You did not hear me incorrectly, but just to make sure, I will restate what I just said. The God of the Bible is not my God. Now, I know that there might be some of you here in the sanctuary or joining us on live stream that are taken aback and maybe even uncomfortable by a statement such as that. Some of you might be intrigued and now have some questions you wish to ask me. Happy to answer them, you can find me at Kiddush. And there could be some of you here who find this to be personally be aligned with your own personal connection and view of God. And I realize that I cannot simply make such a bold statement without providing you with the why. In order to do that, I know that we need to examine the way in which Hashem is described throughout our sacred text. I know that we have countless examples of God being able to be compassionate and merciful. God is even able to be swayed by the great orations of Moses and Abraham and is able to forgive and show a little bit of Rahmanus to our ancient ancestors. And we often see God portrayed as a father, a figure that will sometimes be stern, but also only because that God has the greatest interest of his children in his metaphorical mind and heart. And perhaps most of us think back to when we chant some of the attributes of God during the holidays. Adonai, Adonai, El Rahum Vechanun. A God that is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and faithfulness, and extending kindness to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet this week's Parsha of Bahukotai shows us a slightly different aspect to God. At the beginning of the Parsha in chapter 26, we are told, Im Bahukotai, Telechu Vet Misvotai, Tish Meru Vasi Temotam. If you follow my laws and faithfully observe my commandments, what then follows after this little statement is the next 10 verses give us the countless blessings that we will be able to have in our world befalling us if we follow God. And then in those verses, we are told we will have plenty of rain, something critical to our ancient Near Eastern ancestors and to us today. We are told that we will have plenty of food, told that the fact that vicious beasts will be removed from the land, we will not fall by the sword, and that we will be fruitful and we will multiply. However, after we hear about all of the positive things that are to be associated with our obedience, we are told about what should happen should we, let's just say, fall off the derech or the path. And then we begin to stray from those statutes. In verse 16 of chapter 26, we are told, In turn will I do this to you. I will wreak misery upon you, consumption and fever, which cause the eyes to pine and the body to languish. You shall sow your seed to no purpose, for your enemies shall eat it. How quickly we have come from a loving and nurturing sense of divine, just in one verse. And while this verse seems harsh, I can say that it is only the beginning of the punishments that are to befall us as a people, should we continue not to listen and obey. And as a matter of fact, we have over 20 verses in this section of the Parsha that talk about the pun punishments should we continue to miss the mark, with one of the most disturbing lines appearing in verse 30 where it states, Ba'achaltem basar b'neichem u'vasar b'noteichem tochelu. You shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. You shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. Now some commentators try and say this was really about wealthy families marrying off their children to unsuitable families in return for money. 
Yet others like Ibn Ezra stay truer to the words, meaning there is no greater famine than this, and this is the type of famine that will befall us. And however, to have our divine creator say that this is a form of discipline for our inequities and sins, for me, is into a whole new stratosphere of discipline. As any parent in this room knows, there needs to be consequences for actions but there is also a limit on to how much and how harsh we are to be as the disciplinarian. And now, to be fair to the character of the biblical God, at the end of this chapter, it does state that the entirety of the people will not be destroyed, but only for the sake of the covenant that God formed with the patriarchs. Now, I want to take you back to that potentially alarming statement I made. I did not say I do not believe in God. Rather, I said the God of the Bible is not my God. The way in which Hashem is portrayed is something that does not work with my own modern theology. And I do realize that for our ancient ancestors who are responsible for this view and looking at God in this way, it might have worked, but it does not work for me. It does not work for me to have a God that can choose to intervene in the world in the same way as the God of the Bible. For if that is the God of today, then we as modern Jews are faced with having to answer some very, very difficult questions. I would have to try and reconcile how my divine creator had his strong and outstretched arm involved in horror and sadness. In talking about this aspect of theology with one of my mentors, Rabbi Elliot Dorf, he shared a story that he heard. He shared that there was a terrible accident where a toddler fell into a swimming pool and tragically perished. The family, who was rather stringent in their observance, was told that they should check the scrolls on all their mezuzot to make sure that they were all kosher as if to say something you did or did not do ritually or religiously right caused you this pain, almost as a justification for the tragedy. That is not my God. If that were to be my God, then I and we all would have to struggle and understand why terrible hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, and tsunamis white out villages and take thousands of lives like they deserved it. That is not my God. And if that were my God, then I would have to come up with some explanation for why something like the Holocaust, where millions of lives were lost, was somehow justifiable, and God decided not to intervene. And if that were my God, then I would somehow have to look at the atrocity that happened this past week in Texas, where innocent children and teachers were senselessly gunned down and my God chose not to protect them for some reason. This is not and cannot be my God. So who is my God if it's not the God of the Bible? Some might even ask, where is God in all of this sadness and bloodshed that we still encounter today? I cannot tell you all how to answer this question. But what I can do is share with you how I personally try and combine my personal belief in a divine creator and the realities of the world in which we live. This has led me to be a student, again, of one of my other mentors and teachers, Rabbi Bradley Shavit Artson, the dean of the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies. And Rabbi Artson has been studying the work of Norman Whitehead, a great mathematician and philosopher, and teaches it as a proponent of process theology. And so while I myself concentrated in philosophy while in rabbinical school, I uh, understand it's not everyone's cup of tea, so I will try and summarize the concept as best and quickly as I can. The basic idea is that God is, in the presence in, is a presence in this world is an entity in which we can interact with. And by that, I mean we are drawn to God's lure. Almost think of it like on a string if you're pulling it. 
right? We are drawn to God's lure. And we are creatures with free will. And we might not always follow God's luring of us, and that's sometimes okay, but God is there and trying to lead us along the right way. As Rabbi Artson says, God becomes our cosmic companion, seeking our thriving and making that thriving possible. Just as God is always luring us to an optimal choice and giving us the strength to choose that lure, so we can renew our hope and our strength in the light of the realistic faithfulness. And additionally, he states, a processed faithfulness allows us to put our energy into this world, the work of building inclusive, compassionate communities, living in harmony with creation, doing the work of justice. This is how I am able to reconcile my connection with God in modern times. This is my God, the God that pulls me towards doing the good and the righteous work in the world, the God that works with me to create a better place on earth for everyone, trying to lead me down the right path. And so then in answering the question of where is God in these terrible times and moments, the answer can be, God was found in the heroic teacher who tried to save her students. God was in the responders who went to the school this past week to save the helpless. God is in those who are there to support the families and the community throughout this terrible time. God can and is in each of us as we try to fight for a change to never see something like this ever happen again. That is my God. That is the God I believe in. A God that I can still call out to and pray to and have faith in. And so, Ribono Shel Olam, Master of the Universe, I pray to you on this Shabbat morning that you continue to be that guide and lure us to be better, to be strong, and to uplift others. I pray that you move others in Texas to be a crutch and support for a crippled community. And I pray we all feel the pull to finally make a change and to protect our children and all the peoples on this earth. Let us say, Amen. Amen.